It's a long walk from Narnia. Uh, welcome here. My name is Brian Kropp. I'm one of the associate pastors. And uh, uh, this past month, we've been looking at uh, the topic that it piques our interest quite often, but we don't really talk about it all that much. And that is the topic of the supernatural. And we've been realizing that there is this greater intersection between the supernatural and the natural than we often pay attention to. And uh, as sort of a gateway into that topic, we have been looking at uh, the, the Chronicles of Narnia series, specifically the first book in that series called The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe. Uh, we've looked at uh, the lion so far. We've looked at the witch. Today, we're looking at this thing, the wardrobe. Uh, in 1950, when uh, C.S. Lewis wrote The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, lions were fascinating. They're still fascinating. Uh, well, if all of your experience has been going to the Fort Worth Zoo and looking at the lions there, they're not terribly fascinating. They're mostly sleepy. Um, but I promise you, if we let a lion loose out on Main Street out here, suddenly, terribly fascinating, that lion uh, would capture all of our attention uh, where, where that lion is. Uh, witches are kind of the same way, but in a negative way. Uh, they're, they're fascinating, uh, but we'd like to keep them at an arm's length uh, far away from us. Or maybe they only exist in storybooks. That's really where witches are. Uh, wardrobes, on the other hand, uh, that's it. Um, it's a storage box. That's what it is. You uh, keep clothes in there. It's... C.S. Lewis could have just named the book The Lion, the Witch, and the Closet, and it would have been as motivating, as exciting. Uh, it's, there's not much to a wardrobe. It's a rather just an ordinary piece of furniture. However, if you've read the story at all, you know that that wardrobe is, is not that ordinary. It's actually very extraordinary. It's uh, a gateway into the supernatural. And, and C.S. Lewis is using this to remind us that there is more going on in our natural world, that there is a connection to the supernatural that is much closer than we imagine, but it sometimes shows up in rather ordinary ways. So this morning, uh, we want to look at that topic of, of um, interacting with the supernatural and experience that in the midst of the ordinary of our lives. There's a, a, another rather ordinary thing that uh, often is highlighted around Christmas. Uh, well, you can decide for yourself if it's ordinary or extraordinary, and that is babies. Uh, I get a little sentimental about babies this time of year because uh, all of my children were born between December 31st and February 2nd. Uh, so we get near the tail end of the year. All of them are aging up and I get that misty feeling of, boy, I'm getting old. Um, <laughs> so if you have recently had a baby or you are currently pregnant, you probably more than anyone else are highly aware there are a lot of babies. There are a lot of babies out there. Uh, just by show of hands, how many of you have been around a baby in the last month, huh? Yeah. Uh, how many of you plan or expect to be around a baby over the Christmas holiday? Not as many. Okay, that's cool. <laughs> the rest of you are nursery workers, I understand. Um, but babies are everywhere. There are eight billion of us on this planet. That's a lot of babies. Babies are terribly, terribly ordinary. We see them all the time all the time. And yet they're also very, very extraordinary. Two cells, just two cells, each one carrying half of the necessary DNA code to make a person get together. They, they co-mingle and nine months later, out is birthed this very complex individual person. They are very extraordinary. You remember back when your first baby was born. That baby was free entertainment. You could stare at that kid for hours. Kids doing nothing but staring at the ceiling. Great entertainment. Uh, fascinating. Uh, they are extraordinary uh, things. And yet Christmas kind of tends to uh, favor children and favor babies, particularly one baby. That would be the Lord Jesus as a baby. And uh, we 
start to uh, get called to just the amazingness, the miracle of, of babies. Uh, there's a verse in Psalm 139 that kind of uh, draws that out as we think about what God was doing inside the womb. Uh, it says, for you, meaning God, for you formed my inward parts, you knitted me together in my mother's womb, and I praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Jesus comes out as a baby. He's God Almighty in human form, born of a virgin woman. It's terribly extraordinary. And, and the shepherds are out on, on the fields, and the angels come and announce to them that this extraordinary thing has happened in the town of Bethlehem. And this is the, the electric thing that they say. Uh, and this will be a sign for you. You will find a baby wrapped in swaddling clothes and lying in a manger. Now that's from Luke chapter two. If you haven't read that account of the Jesus story, do. Take the week, read it, bring the family around the Christmas tree and read Luke chapter two. It's a great, great account uh, of what happened. But that, boy, that's an ordinary verse. Uh, they've told shepherds that there's a baby in town somewhere, and he's going to look like every other baby in town, wrapped in swaddling clothes. Now, it's a little unique that he's in a feed trough, uh, but he looks, like, he looks like an ordinary baby in ordinary clothes around ordinary animals. There's an ordinary mom, an ordinary dad. It's just an ordinary scene, and yet this is an extraordinary baby. This is the Messiah. This is the anointed one from God, uh, prophesied from the, before the foundations of the world that he was going to be the savior and the redeemer of all of creation. There is more going on in this very ordinary looking scene. So how do we, in our ordinary lives, uh, experience the supernatural, God's supernatural. Uh, well, first, we need to look for God intentionally. There's a lot of distractions out there. We need to uh, open up our, our understanding, open up our perspective, open up our, our mind to the idea that just maybe there's more going on in the world than what I can experience with my own five senses. Uh, just by show of hands, again, uh, how many of you have seen, read, uh, watched the Chronicles of Narnia, Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe? Well, that's a lot of you. Okay, take a trip with me. The very, very first time you encountered this story, you didn't know anything about what's coming, right? The, let's all admit, the beginning of the book is a little dry. It's not very uh, action-packed. It's very British. Um, you know, it's four kids who are uh, sent away to this country cottage uh, with some lady named Mrs. McCready, who's very strict, and there are all these rules, and it's the kids are relating to one another. <sighs> this is not action-packed. This is not really favor kids' book. It's dry. Now, if you've read the book, now you read all of that beginning bit, and you're like, oh, it's going to get good. There's going to be a hide-and-go-seek game. It's going to be very awesome. But beginning, it's kind of dry. It's rather an ordinary story about ordinary kids in an ordinary place. But then there is the hide-and-go-seek game. And Lucy goes into the, the spare room and, and goes inside the wardrobe to hide. And she's trying to find the back so that no one will know where she is. And do you remember what's written in the book? It says that Lucy's hand felt something soft and powdery and extremely cold. And we are in. We are hooked. How did snow and pine trees get in the middle of an ordinary wardrobe? And we are now in a portal to a, a supernatural location. And Lewis reminds us that we're not just confined to the, the rules and laws of nature. We're not confined only by the, the, the cold, hard logic that's in our natural world. But there's a supernatural God out there, and he created this. And there is a wonder that he's put in, into his creation. There's a majesty, dare I say, magic uh, to, to what he has done. And as we open our eyes intentionally to experience God, to seek him out, out in the midst of our ordinary lives, we just might encounter him in unexpected places. 
In fact, one of the uh, overall themes of this Christmas in Narnia series has been that there is a huge temptation for us to uh, bring our entire world down to what we experience with our five senses, with what we experience in our own circumstance. And that has a tendency to put a wedge between us and the supernatural. The supernatural is trying to get to us, but our focus is on our own lives. And as we uh, lift our eyes up again, as we lift our perspective to the idea that God is out there and God wants to uh, commune with us and talk to us, that we will find him. Now, I want to move to a different account of the birth of Jesus. This is found in the book of Matthew, also chapter 2. Uh, but this uh, talks about uh, a different group of men. They're, they're called wise men. They're also fascinating in their own way. Uh, it says that now after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, in the days of Herod the king, behold, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we saw his star when it rose, and have come to worship him. These are called wise men. They are scholarly folks. They are politically astute. They are king makers. And they have seen something out in the stars that they have interpreted to mean God is doing something in Jerusalem. And we've got to pack up all of our stuff and interrupt our life and go to where this is going on. I will let you read the remainder of Matthew's account of the birth of Jesus to discover how happy Herod was uh, to know that there was a brand new king in town, his reaction to that. I'll I'll leave you to that. Uh, But these wise men were intentionally seeking out this message that God had for them. It was an abstract message. It was a sign in the stars. They had to be intentional about Uh, finding him. And and their travel could have taken, uh, because we don't know where they started from, uh, a couple of months, maybe a couple of years. But it took planning, and it took effort, and it took intentionality. Martin Luther, uh, who was a church reformer back in the 1500s, in one of his Christmas sermons, uh, he wrote this, that if we Christians would join the wise men, we must close our eyes to all that glitters before the world, and look rather onto the despised and foolish things. And I don't know if you've been out around town recently, but there's a lot of glitter. There's a lot of lights. There's a lot of pretty things out there that could distract us from finding God in the midst of our ordinary lives. And the Bible lets us know that if we will seek God out, that God will show himself to us. He, he told uh, an Old Testament prophet named Jeremiah, he told him this, that you will, seek, uh, you will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. And that's a promise, that if we seek God with all our heart, we will find God. And you could be in a, a, a season of life where God seems distant, or, or maybe you think, you think God is playing hard to get or hide and go seek, but if we will intentionally go after him, the Bible says that we will find him. We are not, as a collective, as a race, we are not the brightest bunch when it comes to how we uh, try to find God. We often end up looking for God in the wrong locations. Uh, we try to find him in, lo- in uh, rituals, in experiences. There's a lot of talk this time of year about discover the spirit of Christmas. And that often boils down to, well, for me to have the best Christmas experience I can have, I have to uh, eat that food. I have to see that, that neighborhood of lights. I have to see that movie. I have to go to that concert. Otherwise, Christmas is just not Christmas. And I'm trying to, I think the, the best intention of that is I'm trying to connect with God. I'm trying to connect with the divine in some way, but I'm being distracted by not God. I'm, I'm trying to find him in other things other than God. And yet God has made us to connect with him. Uh, in Acts 17, 27, uh, it talks about it, that they, meaning we, should seek God and perhaps feel their way toward him uh, and find him. He is actually not far from each one of us. Uh, we, we just end up looking for God in the wrong places. But what if, like the wise men, God wants to interrupt 
your life? What if he wants to get in the middle of your everyday comings and goings? You're waking up and you're going to sleep, you're going to work and you're coming home from work. That, that you would start to see God in the middle of the ordinary, that as you are doing your life, you would be asking that God would reveal himself uh, to you. And maybe, just maybe, in the middle of a traffic jam or a flight delay or some political discussion around the Christmas table, you could still find God in the middle of that if you will open up your eyes and ask, where is God in the middle of this? The next thing uh, we want to do to discover the supernatural in our ordinary lives is to listen to God intently. You will find as you seek God and he uh, shows himself to you that not only is God there, but he is not silent. God is talking and what God wants to speak to you and to me is peace and, and, and not Peace like, well, you've now been blessed with a, a lack of conflict in your life. There's nothing but comfort and ease for you. Not that kind of peace. Not peace like the world wants to offer us, but a, a, a deep soul peace. Uh, the kind of peace that regardless of your circumstances, you can have a rock solid confidence that God is with you, that he is walking with you, and you can survive any circumstance if he has provided you with that kind of peace. Uh, notice what the psalmist wrote in Psalm 85, 8. Let me hear what God the Lord will speak, for he will speak peace to his people, to his saints. In Fort Worth, as, as you get out on the highways and the neighborhoods, we're, this is not a city at peace. There's a lot of hustle. There's a lot of bustle. There's a lot of, uh, you got to get to this place and that place. There's not a lot of peace. Uh, but you see, God desires our hearts to be at peace with him and with other people. And again, we know that. So we're trying as best as we can to find peace, but... We're looking for peace in the wrong places. And so we try to uh, find peace in things that aren't God, in substances like you know food or money or drugs or alcohol, or uh, I know that I'm not at peace and I just don't wanna think about it. So I'm gonna cram more stuff into my schedule so I don't have time to think about how much peace I don't have. But it often takes a, a moment in there for us to stop and be still and listen and reflect. What is God saying to me? Uh, the angels uh, said uh, many things to the shepherds. I want to uh, read uh, one of the statements that's really familiar to a lot of us of what they said, uh, but I want to read it in a paraphrase version so that uh, you might hear these, uh, these words in a, in a fresh way this morning. They said, glory to God in the heavenly heights, peace to all men and women on earth who please him. I want you to hear that a little differently than you might be familiar with because I want you to hear that God wants you to be at peace. God wants you to have peace with him and peace in him. Uh, this uh, time of year, we're at the bottom of the calendar. We're about to change over years. It's about to be the year 2020. And uh, what was 2019 about? I don't know. Uh, they say that uh, experience is the best teacher, but I don't think so. I think evaluated experience is the best teacher. It may be good for, uh, for you, for us to uh, take some time over the holiday break, as maybe your schedule is a little looser, uh, to take an hour uh, just by yourself and, and take something with you that you've used to document your life, whether that's a calendar or a journal, maybe it's your Bible, maybe it's a prayer journal, uh, but something where you can go back and you can kind of review uh, the last year. Hey, it's going to be a whole new decade too. Maybe you've got a whole decade to reflect on, but let's just start with the year. Let's make it manageable. Uh, so you're just re reflecting back and see what was God telling me? What was God uh, revealing to me? Maybe ask yourself uh, some questions like this. What did I learn about myself? Or what did I learn about my friendships and my relationships? What did I learn about God over the last year? And maybe even ask yourself some, some deeper, uh, harder questions like, how did I grow in my relationship with God this year? What did I get right? What did I get wrong? And am I at peace with God? There was a, 
a Catholic mystic uh, named Thomas Merton who wrote this, uh, that we are not at peace with others because we are not at peace with ourselves. And we're not at peace with ourselves because we're not at peace with God. I wouldn't be too surprised if in the middle of the evaluation, uh, unresolved issues come up. Uh, There are relationships that are broken that need to be restored. Uh, There's forgiveness either with you and someone else or with you and God. And uh, forgiveness either needs to be given or received. Uh, But you need to to step into that. Make uh, the next step that you need to take uh, in 2020. Ask God, what does he want you to do? What, what kind of person does he want you to become uh, in the middle of this evaluation? Uh, so uh, we need to go looking for God intentionally. We need to listen to him intently. Uh, but there's a third step. We need to live for God intensely. When you find God and you listen to God, you will also discover that he desires all of our commitment. And uh, the amount of commitment we have today, there needs to be an increasing amount of commitment to him. He deserves our entire life. He deserves our entire attention. That is something that all of our hearts long for, is something that we can lean the entire weight of our life on and that it would be worthwhile. Uh, When we uh, run into God and have a, a, a real connection with him, we want to follow him not out of some kind of obligation, Uh, But it's a delight to commit our lives to him. We say, God, I want more of you. I want more Narnia. I want more connection uh, to your supernaturalness and to the power that you give me to live life your way. Uh, There's a verse on the back of your listening guide. It's, uh, again, from uh, Luke 2. Uh, I want to uh, break down that verse uh, just a little bit so that uh, if you were to uh, take this verse over the week and, and memorize it, that you would get more uh, uh, understanding, more impact out of what the angels were saying to the shepherds. Uh, they said, and the shepherds said to them, fear not, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. Now, there's something that happened right there that was very fast. Uh, So I want to break down uh, what the angels said. The job of angels is to carry messages from God. God is not haphazard in what he wants to tell us. And so they used three titles uh, for Jesus to uh, really put a neon sign on the fact that you're going to go see an ordinary baby in ordinary swaddling clothes with ordinary parents and all that. But there is something super extraordinary going on with this particular baby. They give him three titles, Savior, Christ, and Lord. And I want to break those down just a little bit for us. Uh, The first word there is Savior, and this uh, carries with it the idea of redemption, that Jesus is going to be our Redeemer. And there was a lot of uh, slavery in the culture back in Jesus's day in uh, in Israel. And... um, the idea of redemption then would be that they're being bought back. So if you are in slavery, that uh, a, a way to be redeemed would be that I would buy you out of slavery. But that's only partial slavery because we've just shifted owners. That's all that's happened. You were in slavery to that guy, and now uh, I've got you. Uh, but what we're talking about here is full redemption, that not only do I buy you out of slavery, but then I set you free. And that's the kind of redemption that Jesus offers, that all of us are born into a a state of slavery to sin. We can't help ourselves. All of us are are just bent on doing stuff not according to God's ways. We want to rebel against him. We've all done it, and we're slaved there. And Jesus comes in and wants to buy us not just out of slavery, but to set us free. So we're not under the power of sin anymore, but we're, we're free to live in God's ways, in, in God's power. Uh, the Apostle Paul tells us that for freedom, he has set us free. Stand firm, therefore, and do not submit again to the yoke of slavery. So the angels are telling the shepherds uh, that Jesus is wanting to uh, buy 
by the humanity out of slavery to sin, that, that Jesus is our salvation, that he is the purchase of our, our salvation. He is our savior. Uh, the second title is Christ, and that is a Greek translation of a Hebrew word, Messiah. Christ is not Jesus' last name. It is a title, and it means anointed one. It means promised one, that he is the one uh, prophesied through all of the Old Testament that he was going to redeem his people and bring them out uh, of slavery. And a lot of people missed this when Jesus was born because they're looking for a political Messiah or a military Messiah, someone who's going to remove the uh, occupying Roman uh, force there and get them out But Jesus wants to uh, be our Christ. He is the one that we can lean our whole life on because he was the chosen one. We can read all the prophecies in the Old Testament and then watch the life of Jesus and see how he fulfills every inch of what God said that Redeemer was going to be, that he is the one and only Christ. Uh, But that... That is not even the supreme title that the angels gave uh, to Jesus. The, the, the supreme one was Lord, that he was the supreme commander. Uh, he was the one uh, who demanded absolute control of our lives. He deserves our complete surrender. He is our savior. He is our Christ and he is our Lord. Uh, And this this baby is the one who demands our commitment. Uh, This is the one to live for. This is the one to pull the full weight of our lives on. And as we encounter Jesus, we will not, any one of us, uh, be the same after that encounter. He is our Savior. He is our Christ. And he is our Lord. Now, as we've been going through this series, we've had a really good time looking at uh, this uh, fictional book, The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe. As we wrap up the series, I want to uh, transition to uh, some of what C.S. Lewis wrote in his nonfiction writing. Some of you uh, might know that he was considered by some of the greatest author of the 20th century. He wrote 40 books while he was alive. Another 20 were published after he died. He was uh, born in Northern Ireland, and uh, he faced a lot of turmoil, a lot of suffering in his young life that kind of forged in him a certain understanding about who God was and how God wanted to relate to him. Uh, His mom died when he was seven. His dad then shipped him from Ireland to England to uh, a boarding school, so he's sort of abandoned by his dad. He's in a strange place. He's sort of out of his element. Now, C.S. Lewis is, if nothing, a very smart person. So he is excelling academically. He's into classic literature and being able to read it in five different languages. Uh, He does really well at school. And when he graduates and is uh, making his application uh, to Oxford, he passes uh, all of that with flying colors. But he postpones going into university for a time because World War I is on and he enlists into the army to to fight for England. Uh, While serving in the military, he is wounded three different times. And he gets uh, this opinion about who God is because of all of the, the, the suffering and pain that he has experienced in his young life, he gets the opinion that God's not really there. He's a, he becomes an atheist. He's even mad at God for not existing. And he wrote to a friend in the year 1916. Uh, he said that, I believe in no religion. There is absolutely no proof for any of them. And from a philosophical standpoint, Christianity is not even the best. All religions, that is all mythologies to give them their proper name, are merely man's own invention. So he finishes uh, his term with the military. He goes to university. He graduates. He becomes a professor at Oxford University in England. And he bumps into a couple of other uh, intellectual guys, a couple of other professors that have a profound influence on his life. One, uh, his name was Hugh Dyson. Uh, Another one was J.R.R. Tolkien, which some of you might know is an insignificant writer about hobbits and jewelry. 
Uh, but these two guys are real deal Christians, and they start to influence the way C.S. Lewis is thinking about uh, God and, and God's uh, connection with him. Uh, he looks at these two guys, and at first it's, well, God doesn't really exist, but I can tell these guys are into him. And then it moves to, well, maybe, maybe God is out there. I don't know. And then eventually it gets to not only is God out there, but God is real to me as well. And in the summer of 1921, C.S. Lewis becomes convinced that Jesus Christ isn't just the savior of the world. Jesus Christ is the savior of C.S. Lewis. That as Jesus Christ hung on the cross to pay for the penalty of sin for all mankind, he was also paying the penalty of C.S. Lewis's very own sin. And he wrote about his uh, conversion to Christianity and start uh, his faith journey with Jesus. Uh, it's a book called Surprised by Joy. If you haven't read it, I encourage you to go pick it up. Uh, it talks about how he became a Christian and that he entered into this walk of faith kicking and screaming. Uh, he said, you must picture me alone in that room in Magdalene, night after night, feeling that whenever my mind lifted, even for a second from my work, the steady, unrelenting approach of him who I so earnestly desired not to meet. That which I greatly feared at last came upon me in the Trinity term of 1929. I gave in and admitted that God was God and knelt and prayed, perhaps the most dejected and reluctant convert in all of England. That is how the great and mighty C.S. Lewis uh, became a follower of Jesus Christ. It's not a lot of show, it's terribly ordinary uh, there uh, when he made that prayer. And, and C.S. Lewis said that when, when Jesus moved in, it was like the snow melted on his heart. Or to put it in Narnia terms, that the statue stone heart that he had became alive again, that, that he came to Christmas and Christmas came to him. And, and I wonder if, if you have had that same kind of experience where you have encountered Jesus, the extraordinary, ordinary Jesus, where you have realized he's not just savior of the world, but he is your savior, that he died for your sin and that you have started that journey with him. Uh, maybe uh, you've realized that I, what I really need is I need to recommit to him. I, I've made a commitment to him in the past, and I, I, I need to recommit to him. I need to, uh, as Ben was talking about, the four plus two plus six, I need to uh, do something to engage with people, to invite people, to maybe be like those two friends were uh, to C.S. Lewis. I could be that for somebody else. There's the possibility that over the course of the next couple of weeks, you'll be at a party, you'll be at an office gathering, you'll be around relatives, and you might be the only Christian in that room. And it'd be very tempting and very easy to, in a way, kind of slink off into the corner and not talk about what Jesus is doing in your own life, the transformation that he is bringing about. And I encourage you to step in uh, to those moments and identify with, with a need that somebody uh, has that, that God has dealt with you on and how God has uh, helped you and wants to be a help to that person as well. It's true that as you and I, just ordinary people, meet an extraordinary God, that we cannot leave that uh, encounter unchanged. And it's not because of the moment. It's not about anything that we have done in that moment. It's only because of who Jesus is that we have the opportunity to experience in our ordinary lives this connection with the huge, awesome, supernatural uh, Savior and Christ and Lord. Uh, I want to pray for us. Uh, if you haven't uh, yet picked up a copy of Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, I encourage you to swing by Amazon. They'd be happy to send you one. Uh, it's a really great read. Uh, if you haven't read it in a while, pick it up again. It's a lot of fun. I, I want to pray for us. Uh, and I want you to also hear uh, what the angels told the shepherds, that when, they, or when the shepherds saw this ordinary, extraordinary uh, baby, uh, it says that when they saw it, the baby, uh, they made known the saying that had been told them concerning the child and all who heard it wondered at what the shepherds told them. They had a very real encounter with an ordinary looking but very extraordinary Jesus. Let's pray. 
Father, we're just a few days away uh, from the time when we celebrate the, uh, when you sent your son Jesus here. We acknowledge that Jesus is your son, that he is the fulfillment of all of the prophecies of the Old Testament, and that he is the one who would give his life to buy us out of our slavery to sin. And then he rose up again to prove that he really is Lord. And God, we give you thanks for that. Uh, if you are here and are already a follower of Jesus and, and you know that you need to recommit uh, your uh, commitment to Jesus, uh, you might uh, pray something like this right now. God, I pray that you would open my eyes uh, to see you in a fresh way. I pray that uh, you would open my ears to listen to you intently as you speak to me and call me and challenge me to grow for you. God, I want to live as intensely as possible, letting my life matter and telling people about you. And then if you're in that space that a C.S. Lewis was so many years ago where you know that you don't have a relationship with Jesus, but you want that today. Um, he's speaking to you and he's speaking to you clearly. I pray that you would pray this along with me. God, I acknowledge that Jesus is who he says he is. He is the Christ, he is the Savior, and he is the Lord. And God, I, I want Jesus to be my Savior and my Christ and my Lord. So as best as I understand it, from this day forward, I'm committing myself to following you. I ask Jesus that you would forgive me of my sin, help me to grow and know and learn more about this in the coming days. Today, Jesus, I turn my life over to you. And God, we thank you for being with us this morning. We thank you that the supernatural is not far away, that you are not far away. Thank you for speaking to us, and thank you for listening to us. We pray all these things together in the extraordinary name of Jesus. Amen.